This is mini lecture number nine, which corresponds to chapter 10 of Tillich entitled Moralisms and Morality, Theonomous Ethics. Uh, again, we're going to have polarities here, uh, and it's going to be in terms of moralisms in contrast to morality. Generally, or often, uh, the, when you put ism at the end of, of something, that gives it a negative connotation. And this is certainly the case here with the word moralism as Tillich is using it. He writes near the beginning of this chapter, moralism designates an attitude towards life, an attitude which is widespread in this country. It is the distortion of the moral imperative into an oppressive law. One can find a Puritan, an evangelistic, a nationalistic, and simply a conventional moralism, which is not conscious of its historical roots, till it adds. Moralism, or amoralism, is a system of, of ethics, a system of rules uh, for behaving in, in society. But it is particular, somewhat relative to a particular place and time. Uh, uh, moralisms are conditional. Cultures change, situations change. What about the other side? Morality as the moral imperative quote, end quote, moral imperative. Tillich writes on the next page, 134, morality in the first place is the experience of the moral imperative. It is a function of man as man. Without it, he would not be man. A being without the consciousness of a moral demand is not human. A, a, if a feeble-minded child behaves as if he were unaware of any moral demand, he is subhuman which does not mean that he is an animal. He is both more and less than an animal. In contrast to him, a criminal is aware of the moral imperative while defying its commands. He is human, although he fights against an essential element in human nature. For man as man has the potentiality to contradict itself. Now this moral imperative is unconditional. What does that mean? Well, in our essence, as God created us to be, we are called upon to always do the right thing. Do right. And that call is absolute. And that contrasts with moralisms, which tend to become absolutistic. Uh, absolutism is associated with moralisms. We take a particular culture or subculture, particular form of a religion, their, their list of, of rules and say, these are absolute. We have to take these uh, legalistically uh, in, in absolutely each and every situation. Well, there, there can be a reaction against this as intelligent people realize, well, uh, moral rules are somewhat relative to culture and, uh, and to the particular situation, sometimes the unique, complicated situations we face in life. And so it's easy to, to criticize moralisms when they make absolute claims. And that can lead to the flip side of absolutism, which is a relativism or a skepticism, because there's no particular finite, limited system of morality that's absolute and applies perfectly to every situation, every culture. We can turn around and say, well, there is no morality at all. Things are totally relative to a particular person, a particular situation, a particular culture. 
And again, if we adopt this moral imperative, we realize that neither, neither absolutism nor relativism are correct. Uh, the, the particular contents of any one system of morality are never absolute or unconditional, but God has this absolute demand for us to do the right thing in every situation. That's what we're called to, to be in our essence as human beings created by God. And we see here that uh, this moral imperative is internal to us. It's part of our essential being in uh, that, that sense of essence as the ideal we're created to be. On the other hand, moralisms are external. They, they come from the outside and they're imposed upon us. It's a stranger ruling us. Now, Tillich notes, uh, there's actually two ways that the, these external moralisms can be, uh, become part of, of our way of life. One is by an outright imposing, where we just do it be, because we know we're going to be penalized if we don't follow a particular law or a particular uh, conventional uh, rule of morality. On the other hand, that's not really the most effective way to, for a society, a ruling, uh, a ruling clique, to impose its will on people. Because if you think someone's not watching, or if you think you can get away with it uh, uh, without uh, any or much of a penalty, you're liable to, to disobey that moralism. It's better for society or for those who are ruling society if we, if people internalize the moralisms of a particular culture. And there, there's a, a somewhat contemporary, he, he died a few years ago, but a, a more or less contemporary thinker named Michel Foucault, a French uh, deconstructionist or post-structuralist who very much emphasized that our knowledge, our morality, is very much controlled by power. Uh, and the, generally the one who has the most power you know, kind of rules society. But he made a distinction between weak and strong power. And it kind of parallels what Tillich said many years before. Weak power is when you have to impose it. Uh, where it's obvious it's coming from the outside and being imposed. Strong power is when we internalize the, the, the rules of those who control society. Now, Foucault is extremely suspicious uh, uh, that there can ever be true morality because it's always going to be dominated by uh, power things, and we, we try to resist power and maybe succeed to, to some degree, but it's all a power game. Tillich is, is more nuanced and sees two sides to this, uh, this tendency uh, uh, for moralisms to, to be uh, put upon uh, people in society. Uh, he writes on 139, one is born into a moral universe, produced by the experience of all formal, former generations. It is a mixture of natural interest, especially of the ruling classes. So there he, he uh, says what Foucault says later. And wisdom acquired by the leading people. A moral universe is not only an ideology that is a product of the will to gain and to preserve power. It is that, but not only that. It is also, till it continues, a result of experience and real wisdom. So we got both. So, so moralisms aren't all bad. They have, they have some truth. Now, we have basically this outside authority. And for many, especially those who uh, are given to psychology, would say that this typically involves projecting the father, projecting 
a father figure that is this uh, kind of the superego, to use Freudian terms, that we need to obey, whether uh, because the father figure has imposed it upon us or we've internalized his values. And some uh, have reduced or tended to reduce all morality just to this, this psychological giving in to the father figure. Uh, and, and saying that all we really have are these conditional moralisms. But Tillich makes an important point when he says that, oh, okay, yeah, you, you do have a point, uh, that, that we, there are these problems with moralisms, there's a lot of projection going on, but we wouldn't be able to project these moralisms except unless there were a screen upon which to project them. And that screen is the unconditional, it's the divine, it's the depth dimension, it's God. And so there is this unconditional screen, or this, this screen of the unconditional, that uh, gets us in touch with this moral imperative that's part of our essence as human beings. Okay, I think we're ready to uh, get into the, the section on law. And um, the, the key word here is legalism. Uh, moralisms that are uh, come from the, the, the outside that uh, are put upon us externally basically come across as laws that we have to follow more or less to the letter. And that, this legalism uh, results in various kinds of, of problems or uh, various kinds of problematic emotions, we might say. If we have some passion, some concern about fulfilling the law or laws, we can end up in a situation of complacency, Tillich writes. We can say, yeah, I've done all the law or all the important, the most important laws. I've been a good person, a good citizen. Or we might maybe have a, a little uh, uh, more uh, fastidious conscience and we realize we fall short of all these moralisms, all these laws. And so that can alternatively result in despair. Or maybe, uh, maybe after we've sort of uh, tried one or both of these other things or just because we're kind of wrapped up in other concerns, we might just end up having a lot of indifference to, to laws and, and to moral laws and moralisms. And there is a, a valid concern uh, in these systems of morality that every society, every culture has, though it, it wrongly tends to absolutize them. There is a real concern for justice, that, that people are treated fairly, that uh, People who, who do good uh, re receive some kind of, uh, of uh, reward or, or experience in life that's commensurate with their goodness. Those who, who have done evil face some kind of consequence that is, is appropriate and just. But again, when we're in this, this, this realm of the external imposition and legalism, uh, you know, justice is never going to be, be fulfilled. So what is the solution? Is there a solution? Tillich says yes. And it's grace. It's unconditional acceptance or love. That is what brings salvation. That is what heals. That is what overcomes all the separation, all the injustices. And in contrast to, to this legalism that kind of commands, you know, you must do the law, from the outside, grace is something that, that wells up from God, but within us. And it brings or makes possible forgiveness. And it makes possible regeneration. We become new creatures in Christ for Christians, new creatures in God. And instead of something imposed from outside, external, 
it's part of our essential nature. And so with grace, we, we fulfill the law with joy. We do it not as, as this outside demand or command, but as this moral imperative that comes from God, that comes from our own uh, essential nature. And we do the law or we do good. We fulfill the moral imperative with joy. So, grace reunites justice with love and fulfills, grace fulfills justice, as Tillich puts it. Now, in all of this, and this is very important, and Tillich highlights this a couple places in this chapter, because there is no absolute finite human authority, there's always risk involved in, in acting out, in acting upon this moral imperative. Because we are finite, limited human beings, despite maybe the best intentions, we'll sometimes get it wrong. So as Tillich puts it, morality, morality as moral imperative that gets beyond these moralisms, always involves risk it always involves courage. We need to take upon ourself, ourselves in grace, through grace, the possibility that we, we may mess it up. We may not get it fully right. But we, we take that risk and try to do the right thing. Now, before we close it out, let me uh, mention three very important terms that Tillich does use in this chapter and other places in his writings, uh, especially when he writes about ethics or morality. The, the first term, heteronomy, is on this side with moralisms. Hetero means to be other or outside, and nomus means law. So there's an outside law, an external law, that demands we do it. And we, we've talked about all the problems till it sees with that. But a, a typical human tendency in our sinfulness, in our estrangement, is to react against the, this imperfect demand from the stranger to comply with their morality, or their moralisms. Uh, we might take an opposite extreme, which is autonomy. We become a law unto ourselves. Yeah, whatever I think is right or whatever will, will meet uh, my needs, that's what's right. I can determine right or wrong just myself. That kind of goes along with relativism. You know, it's just relative to me or, or even subjective. What I say goes. But beyond these, these bad alternatives, is theonomy. Well, I think you can guess what, what this word means, because you already know nomi or nomos refers to law. And theo is the Greek word for God, the Latin word deo, uh, an excelsius deo. So theonomy means God rules. And that overcomes the problems. Because when we're in this unconditional state of grace, uh, fulfilling the moral imperative, it's not that law uh, or moralisms come from the outside, but God is there with us in our essential nature. So God's law is not something from the outside, but, but wells up and fulfills our own true deepest nature. Theonomy, theonomous ethics. And again, what Tillich is hoping uh, in, in, on a wider scale in terms of religion and culture, religion and society, is for you know, society, for culture to become more theonomous, for that depth dimension to be more fully realized in, in our culture. So let's uh, close it up. Um, again, coming back to this relationship between 
justice and grace or love and risk. Love includes justice. Love without justice is a body without a backbone. The justice of love includes that no partner in this relation is asked to, to annihilate oneself. The self which enters a love relation is preserved in its independence. Love includes justice to others and to oneself. And we might add, it involves a courageous risk. Love, till it concludes, is the solution of the problem, moralisms and morality.